So, if you hold this again, Tom. Um, so we've got, let's say we had, um, here's a, of course you'll do uh, something a little better than this. The pH of lime is 12.4, okay? This is typically the pH of lime. Uh, they vary by quality, but that's what we're, that's what we're looking for. We're trying to get as close to 12.4 as we can with our particular soil. Um, so let's say, here, here's 3%, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12. This is what we're going to do for uh, Santa Teresa. Let's say at the 3%, we have a pH of 9.5. And at 4%, we have a pH of... Uh, 10.5, and at 5% we have a pH of uh, 11.5, and at 6% we have 11.8, and at 7% we have 11.8, and at 8% we have 11.8, and at 9% we have 11.8, and eventually you're actually going to start, the strength of your block will fall off the, the pH level. So what you're looking for with this particular sample is we never did get to 12.4. That's not the point. You might, but you, you probably won't. So we're looking at uh, 11.8, which, which we attained at 6%, then that's the one we want to use. We want to use 6% line. Now, the way we do the test is you have these little test vials. And, uh, Martin, did you hand out that stuff or show them that stuff I sent you yesterday? No. Been up too late. Okay. We got an email There's with um, this process. Pardon? No, I'm yeah. just saying I did okay. get the email from you. It was 1 a.m. <coughs> I didn't get a chance to send uh, it. So, James, can I ask a question? Pardon? So, just to understand, you put the lime in until the pH levels off, and then you use the lowest amount of lime <laughs> you can where it starts to level off. That's right. That's right. Because if you if you bought seven percent or eight percent, you'd be at the same pH, but you'd just be wasting this money over here, you know, buying lime that you didn't need. Okay. And also, you get up here real high, you can then ultimately the, the strength of the block can fall off. So you're you're looking for this ideal number right here. The way we do it is we have a pH meter right here, um, and. Uh, we have some solutions that we keep the bulb in to keep it clean and keep it uh, moist. And then we put the, you, you calibrate the pH meter. You get these pre-made calibration tubes, pH 7, pH 10. The 7 is here. It's yellow. The solution is yellow. The, ten, <laughs> the container is yellow. And the pH 10 is blue, blue container. And you put your pH meter in there. <coughs> Then it will give you a reading if you turn it on. It's good to turn it on. Okay. James, quick so, question. Quick question on you. The samples that you have there submerged fully in water? Diesel? Uh, in the 110 milliliter vials? Yes. Uh, So we're, I'm not going to go through the whole calibration thing, but this thing is at 9.92 right now. And it's got a calibration button on it so that you can bring it up to 10. Mm -hmm. Then you clean it off. You do it over again with the 7 just to double check that you're right on the money with the pH meter. Okay, let's say we're right on the money. Then we're going to, we're going to have measured into um, 25 grams all right, you're going to have 25 grams of sample in every one, but you're going to have different percentages of lime. So if you have, let me recalculate it here. If you wanted 3% of 25 grams, you have... Seven five grams of lime. Okay, this is lime. All right, this is soil. 
right? So you'd have 24.25 grams of soy. And at 6%, for instance, you'd have 1.5 grams of lime, and therefore you'd have 23.5 grams of soy, and so on and so on. You with me? Yep. Are you with me? Yes. 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 Hello? Anybody there? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they can hear me or not. I can't hear you. Something happened. Let's see. You shake your head yes. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, give me yes. 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 Yeah, give me no. Yes. Oh, thumbs up. Well, I can't hear you. What's what? What happened here? You're muted right All of a sudden. But here we go. So I'll, I won't ask you if you're following. Yeah, I'll just muted. assume so. <laughs> uh, so Where's the mute? Stuff. So you're, you're measuring the 25 grams uh, into into your vials. Then you you fill them to the it's a hundred two milliliter vial. You fill it to the hundred milliliter mark with distilled water, okay? Distilled water. We check the pH <laughs> of the distilled water, and it's supposed to be seven, but we did this in <coughs> Mexico one time, and we bought battery uh, water, and we bought ironing water, and one was 6.8, one was 7.2, so we mixed them to get it seven. So you can't even trust the distilled water in a bottle. You need to check and see what the pH is of that. Okay, you're looking for seven. And you test your soil, just out of curiosity to see what it is to start with. And then the ASTM, this is an ASTM test. And what you do is you, after you've mixed those, the proper amount of soil, the proper amount of lime, fill it to the 100 milliliter mark with distilled water, close the cap, lock it shut, and then you shake it 30 times every 10 minutes for an hour. Okay, do, 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 do. you do this to all, however many samples you're doing. You're doing uh, 30 shakes every 10 minutes for an hour. Then you let it settle out. You let it settle out. And, well, we'll take one of these that's already done. I don't think the pH is going to read anymore, but, you know, these are a couple years old. But this was a G at 8%. And it will look something like this. It will be a little cloudier because it's been sitting for a year. But after you uh, shake it at the end of the hour, you let it settle out. Then you take the pH meter and you don't put it in the soil sand mix. You just you put it in the liquid and as close as you can to the soil sand mix. You swirl it around a little bit and you'll get a pH reading. Okay. This is 11.36. All right, so you would mark that on your Judy at 8%. At 8%, you would mark, or I'm sorry, 8%, 11.36 would be right here. There's Judy, okay? And, um, and she's going to have gone, it's typically not a gentle curve like that, it, it kind of, takes off and then it goes up pretty high and then it starts to climb slowly and then it falls off typically. But this is the one you're looking for and that was should be at eight percent, eleven point three six. Okay. Um, then you you have you have found your ideal percentage of lime by weight to your soil. Then to make a block you would do the same thing. You're weighing you're weighing one of things obviously you have a gram scale. Right here. Um, there's a funny story to tell about that, but I won't do it right now. Um, <laughs> the grand scale and, uh, and your little testing spoons. You tear your platelet. Yeah. You put it in the bottle. Do the same thing with your soil. Here's, here's the soil that we're using right now to test for Santa yeah, Teresa. This is screened through a 40 sieve. Um, 
They're very fine. Here's the way it looks. Because you're not testing the pH of the sand and gravel. You're testing the pH of the clay, which is what they're after. Um, these are uh, testing screens. This is a 40 sieve. You can't see the holes, of course, but maybe you know about this stuff. Uh, this is a 200, which is uh, you can't even see through. But for this uh, pH test, typically you do the 40, and that's what we're going to weigh into the platen, put in our vial, fill it to the still water, shake it up, let it sit. pH. Now you'll get this curve, and you'll know. But you can ask questions, but I can't hear them. Yeah, can um, you hear us? For some reason. Can you hear us now? Boy, that's just amazing. Should I call his mic on? Well, I don't know. I know our um, architect has a, several it's questions. It's just wild. <clears throat> Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Okay. Um, we then take our, yeah, our samples. We, we figure out from the test what uh, percentage of line we wanted. Is there a chat box on that? And then we weigh some again with the gram scale in small yeah, quantities and put it in this little test block machine right here. Put it in here. Pump it up like that, yeah. and we make these little guys, okay, which are very handy for our testing material. Then you cure them. Lime takes its 20-day cure. You can't take them out early, although they'll, no. they'll divorce. Yeah. So you want the 28-day cure, and then you can take your block and either get it crushed or basically <coughs> after when I'm. I already know that the clay is going to work to make an earth block. I'm I'm testing the lime to make sure we're stabilized. So I take these and these little rockets, and uh, don't, just put them in a jar of water and see what happens. And hopefully nothing. <laughs> We're close to it. Okay. Um, maybe I should just try to call you again, Sarah, so we talk, uh, so you can ask questions if you have any, because I can't hear you. Okay? Bye. Did the Skype work for audio both ways? Or is it supposed to? So that, that, that should work for audio both ways. It's, he might have muted it on his end. I mean, we could wait. Can you hear us now? Well, if he muted it on his end, he he might have can you hear us now? He probably he should hear now. I mean, I think he pressed the button on the side. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you, can you, can you, can you lower the volume? Can you just write that on a piece of paper and hold it up to the screen so you know? Check volume. Check volume. Or did we just check call volume. again? It'll be, um, just just have write it right. check volume. It's so funny. Yeah. It's so funny. <laughs> We're not hearing him now, and he's saying. How come we're not hearing him now? There he goes. Now he's messing with the mic. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? No plug. No plug. So get on this. That wouldn't help much, would it? Well, okay. <laughs> we can't hear him. All right, can we recall him? Yes. 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 How, how can we call him? And we can just do audio. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Can you hear us? No. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. We can I hear you up. just fine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, All right, we're back. Plug it in. All right, we have a little speaker there. <laughs> and this is why. Okay. Okay, we can hear you. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, okay, questions? I have uh, one. Yeah, James, so did you say you always put it through the sieve before you test the soil? Like the soil in your jars went through a sieve first? Yeah, it did go through a sieve. Um, you know, I'm trying to get it down to as fine a science as you can. I don't know that it's absolutely necessary. Um, you know, but then again, we have, you know, here's here's a rough sample that came, you know, from uh, just digging with a shovel in a guy's yard, you know. And that's, we got a lot of big rock in there and stuff, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with your pH. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yes, we can hear you. Um, so, so yeah, we screen it. This is, um, we've got some stuff here that was screened. You know, we, I screen it down just because I like to get a, an idea of the gradation of the sample myself. You can get a sieve test at a laboratory. It'll tell you exactly what percentages you have of, uh, you know, large gravel, small gravel, large sand, small sand, silt, and clay. But 
for me you know i screen it through a half inch and then a quarter inch and then an eighth inch and then a sixteenth inch and then i go to the forty sieve and then went to the two hundred sieve even get this little fine powder but i just it's not official it's not something that you know i give to the client like here's your uh, granular distribution because you could get that done at a lab for 50 bucks but um and james but for me but for me i like i like to use the finer stuff for this ph test because i know i'm not getting any interference you know with weights and james big chunks of rock in there yes when you um when you're testing a site to use local materials how many test points do you take uh i mean obviously you have to take it from more than one spot how many do you take and how far apart well, what area yeah yeah that's really site specific um because uh, you know the the site for instance that this soil i just showed you came from not the santa Teresa, but but this other one right here um it's a big flat plain with pretty much all the same stuff you know so you don't need to dig punch a whole bunch of holes the best you know if i'm just digging holes with a shovel um i'll just do two or three typically but if somebody's serious and, you know, we're really looking hard, then it's, the best thing is to have is a profile hole. You know, maybe they're doing a, a septic system or something and they had a backhoe out there and they <coughs> dug something you can walk down into and you can see the layers. You know, you can see where the topsoil ends and what you have underneath it and all that kind of stuff. Um, you, you definitely, and, and how deep you dig the holes, you know, you have to get beyond the topsoil. We can't we don't if it smells if it smells musty then that's not us you know you've got to get below that humus or whatever and and get down to uh, a clayey uh, soil layer uh, topsoil varies in thickness around the globe from you know <laughs> a sixteenth of an inch to in the desert to um, you know 40 feet in the rainforest you know um, so just getting past the topsoil is, is the first thing. And how many holes? Um, three. <laughs> <laughs> Say, site specific. Other questions? Yeah. All right. um, so uh, I have a couple, a couple of questions actually. One is uh, regarding something you said in the beginning. Um, you mentioned that you finish your exterior walls with um, lime stucco and that you leave the brick bare on the inside and because it breathes. And that's actually one issue you've been having here has to do with uh, the wall, allowing the walls to breathe, allowing vapor to pass. So I was wondering what you normally do for insulation to avoid, um, you know, creating a, a vapor barrier there. Right. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we're we're actually engaged in a little group I've formed or engaged right now, and uh, we found the two spots. And I was, did, need to get the funding to mm. build two houses with the same footprint, but one in a hot climate and one in a cold climate. So they're going to have different treatments, you know, to, mm -hmm. to stay cool or to stay warm. But when you say insulation, I'm assuming we're we're trying to stay warm. Right. Um, yes. In a cold, in a, in a cold climate, and the, the best way to do that uh, and maintain breathability um, is a cavity wall, and then you can use a, some sort of breathable insulation, you know, cellulose, vermiculite, mm -hmm. perlite, uh, pumice, you know, something like that, that you can put in the cavity, uh, and then with your clay plaster on the inside, lime plaster on the outside, you're still, you know as breathable as you can get and be water resistant. You know what I mean? Okay, um, perfect. In, in Colorado, I built in Colorado for a long time, and a lot of the buildings, they, they just didn't want to afford, you know, the double wall. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did, you know, a single wall, typically 14 inches thick, and then uh, put, put insulation on the outside of it. And um, you can either, you know, nail up rigid, closed cell insulation or you can spray foam the thing um, and that's that's what we did okay. uh, if they if they didn't want the cavity wall so your your purest breathability as in vapor can pass completely in and out of the building is shut down right. um, which does which does not negate uh, totally the the benefits of an earth 
as long as you use clay on the inside, uh, your wall is still absorbing and releasing uh, humidity. You're just not doing it from, from outdoors. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to have to get the outdoors from your windows, you know, or, or air exchanger or heat exchanger or whatever you're <coughs> doing to stay warm. Um, my first house in Colorado, we, we uh, stayed cool in the summer just by opening a couple of transom windows at night and closing them in the morning. And everything stayed, you know, comfy all the time. Um, we also, it was a pretty large house. We heated it in the winter uh, with a wood stove, primarily. Um, but it was insulated, you know, with two inches of rigid foam on the outside. Uh oh, Thank you. low battery. <laughs> uh, more questions? I actually wasn't clear about the sitting part. Uh, so it's like when you're building the block, do you actually as well put it through the sieve? And do you use the same sample that you're using to build the block to actually test the pH? Or do you have a different sieving process for testing the pH? And then you use the whole earth material that you dig out to actually build the brick? Yeah, that's right. Um, if um, you know, I'm, if I'm if I'm going so far as to do the pH test, then uh, we're um, you know we have our sample. Yeah, you know, you know, we're, you know we we have the quantity we're going to to use to make the blocks. You know, I mean, if the pH test fails, then we don't have the quantity. I mean, but you know, we're. If we've gone so far as to do the pH test, we, we feel quite confident that we're looking at a source somewhere. Gravel pits are a great source because they're after sand and gravel, and they frequently have overburden, which they call it, which is clay. And we like it, and we can get it there. If we're taking it from the site, then, you know, it's different. We just have to mine it and uh, do, the, do the tests. The other thing is that the test isn't so rigorous if the client wants to use Portland cement uh, as a stabilizer, that's certainly fine. Um, you know, it works great. Um, I'm not knocking it. It's better than not stabilizing, that's for sure. Um, but um, we were just talking about lime today. And I don't want you to go away from this thinking that Jim only uses lime. No, he doesn't. He uses whatever is appropriate uh, for the soil, you know, but if you want to use lime, then you have to be, be careful about the soil and the clay's lime combination. And you need um, a higher percentage of clay than you would with cement. So Jim, I think the question okay. was, is are you, are you uh, in, during production, are you actually sifting the soil uh, to try to get more clay, or are you just using the sieve just for the creation. Oh. No, no. That 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 very fine sifting that you that I showed you was just for the laboratory test. Okay. I mean, you you'd be forever uh, sifting, you know, <laughs> enough soil to make ten thousand earth blocks that fine. We um, you can make an earth block, my general rule of thumb is uh, if you screen down to a half inch um, and three eighths is better. Uh, three eighths is my favorite um, to to screen it to to make blocks. What is your next drain? You know, if you if if you only screen to like an inch or something, you know, you can get a, a one inch rock, <coughs> and, and two things happen with that. Number one is real hard on your machine, you know, because you're wearing metal, um, and number two, it's a modulus of rupture spot in the block. You know, if you got a if you got a three inch thick block and it's got a one inch rock in the middle of it, you know, it's, it's not what you want. You want it thorough, thoroughly mixed. What's the practical way to get that proper weight ratio in the field when you're doing large quantities? Okay, well, you, you're doing all your stuff with the gram scale in the lab and then you're getting real exact numbers and then and by weight and then you just have to convert those weight numbers to volume for the guys in the field. Because the guys in the field aren't going to, you know, they're not going to be weighing anything um, other than we calibrate our mixer in the field by weighing buckets of soil and buckets of sand and buckets of stabilizer to make sure we're getting the, you know, okay, it's this many buckets. And we convert it to volume, you know, uh, for the field. 
and in volume, if you're loading with shovels or loading with buckets or loading with a skid steer or whatever, you've still got a volume that you're, you're putting in there. You with me? Yeah. We have a mixer, and the mixer we has two hoppers, and we put the soil sand mix in the big hopper. We put the lime or the cement or the combination of the two in the other hopper, and a belt runs underneath the soil and sand, and then there's an auger in the stabilizer hopper that drops a measured amount according to the speed of the belt so that we're always getting 6% or whatever it is, whatever percent we want by weight. We've converted the volume in the gym. What about, okay. is that, uh, what about curing time for your different bricks? Uh, I know that's going to vary based upon the soil and whatnot and the mixtures and whatnot, but what typically is safe to start constructing? What's the minimum amount of curing time would you recommend? Okay, well, for lime, it's 28 days. And for cement, the ASTM standard for cement cures 28 days. Actually, both products are continuing to get harder past that point, but that's a, you know, a that standard for stabilization. Now, the truth of the matter is, and one of the reasons that a lot of people decide to use cement instead of lime, even if they could use lime, is because it's faster. Um, even though the ASTM standard is 28 days, a cement stabilized block, you can take out of the pile and it'll be a rock in a week to 10 days. And you can, you can continue curing the wall. The lime stabilized blocks, you know, I prefer to leave them to do their dance for the full 28 days in a cool covered place. And the reason for that is when you stabilize with cement, the cement is combining with the sand, gravel, silt in the soil matrix to stabilize the block. It doesn't really care that much about the clay. The clay is necessary because it's what's holding the block together when it comes out of the machine. With lime stabilization, it's exactly the opposite. The lime doesn't really care about the sand, gravel, or silt. The lime is after the negative electrical charge that clay has, and they're doing a chemical marriage that's slower than cement. Uh, and that's why you really need that 28 days, in my opinion. When you say, uh, when you say cool, what temperature are you referring to, roughly? Temperature? Yeah, I mean, you say cool, that, I mean, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, below, not below freezing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know, I guess ideal would be, you know, 60, 65, something like that, you know, but you, you can't, <laughs> that's one of those things you can't, you can't control. Right. You know, I mean, we we made blocks in Haiti and cured them when it was 110, which is all there was to it. You know, I made them in Colorado and cured them when it was 40, because that's what it was. Um, but you know, a, a test for the cure is you know you take one out and you drop so it in a five gallon cool. bucket of water and see what happens. You know, are you there or not? And, uh, <laughs> what's the pro what's we'll the see. process for uh, the Portland the, the um, the, 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 the cure, the temperature question is also is true of adobes, too. Um, one of my associates, Lisa Schroeder, wrote a book about adobe, and uh, she wanted to cure, you know, adobes are famous for standing them up out there in the desert, but she did a lot of tests in New Zealand and found that if they were cured in the shade, a little slower, they were tougher. They got a higher PSI, uh, which makes sense, you know, Frank plaster or blocks or, you know, the slower the cure, the better. Uh, the guy that pours your concrete driveway should be out there for three weeks wetting it down, you know, to slow the cure and make it stronger. But he doesn't because it's hard already and he gets paid and he goes away. <laughs> well, it's the same thing with uh, the lime. Uh, you just want it, you want it to be slow, moist and cool and slow. Uh, James, what ratio do you use when you are using Portland cement and what's your process for determining that? Uh, I basically, just I use 6% uh, by weight as a standard for a wall block that is going to be plastered. Okay? Um, maybe I could get by with 5, I don't know. But the um, I've also done some stuff lately with combining the two. I saw a study that was done in India at some university there, and they had tested you know, their particular soil, which I don't know what their soil was, but they were stabilizing with... Um, 6% cement and 2% lime 
and 4% cement, 4% lime, and 2% lime, and 6% cement, blah, blah, blah. They had this little matrix that they did for their soil and their, and then cure the blocks, and the strongest blocks they got were the 50-50 were the mix uh, by weight, 50% you know, lime, 50% cement. Well, okay, so it's, it's, it's possible to combine them and improve your product. I don't know that it's necessary, um, but you know, we have done a little messing around with it lately. The box we just made for the build we're on right now are six percent lime, two percent cement. Um, <coughs> hey, hey, Jim, uh, I had a question the about soil, the, the soil. Wasn't yeah? Go ahead. Yeah, about the soil composition, and you mentioned uh, clay, and you mentioned sand, and do you have an ideal mixture of clay to sand, or other characteristics in the in the uh, soil to mix this with? Right. Yeah, the clay uh, percentage uh, minimum is 10. And now this is, again, my opinion and based on my years of experience, I just saw a matrix that was done by another machine manufacturer who said that the ideal clay content was 10. And I was like, hmm, not for me. Um, that's, that's a minimum. And um, I consider an ideal to be 20, 20% 20 clay. Weight okay. or volume? Uh, weight. Okay. Yeah. Little story on that, I was at a, a conference in Barrachera, Colombia, and it was attended by Gernot Menke, a fairly famous uh, German philosopher, uh, engineer, author. Uh, he wrote two fabulous books on earth and construction. Anyway, I met him there, neat guy. But there was a, a woman that gave a presentation, and uh, she had done all these uh, various, trying to do vegetable stabilizers and adobe you know, pear juice or cactus juice or whatever she was doing. But her whole presentation was, was in volume. And um, when she finished, they, they would ask for questions from the audience. And uh, somebody would raise their hand and somebody would walk over and hand them a microphone. And they'd ask their question. She finished and, and Gernot was sitting right across the aisle from me. This was in a cathedral, so it was like a, we were sitting in a church. And he was sitting right across the aisle in the pew. And he didn't wait. He didn't wait for the uh, microphone. He just stood up and said in a very loud voice, if you do your measurements by volume, you can be off by 40%. <laughs> and he was just like, you know, like right between the eyes. He was just staggered up the stage. So um, everything is by weight. You convert to, you have to convert to volume for the field, you know, but you want to get your, when you're testing to get your ideal matrix, you know, you want to, you want to do it by weight. And it's easy to convert to volume after that, you know? Okay. Um, so, did I get off topic there? What was the so, question? Uh, yeah, the, the mix of clay and sand. In, oh, in yeah, yeah. So, so 20% uh, is uh, what Sapper Maini at the Oroville considers ideal, and I, I agree with him. 20% uh, is ideal. 15% is fine. 25% <coughs> is fine. If you get up to 30 and beyond a percentage of clay, it's an easy fix. You add sand, you know, and then you can make a good earth block with just sand and clay. But you mo you've almost always got some silt in there, um, you know, because it just it comes with the territory. And then um, gravel, yes or no? Uh, sometimes you don't have it. I did some. The best soil I ever used was here in Texas, and it came from a pit where they were mining. Uh, DG, de decomposed granite. And so their overburden uh, was 24.9% clay and it had all these little tiny chips of granite in it. Wow. It was, it was great to have that, that little bit of gravel in there uh, just because it, it increased the PSI, the NPSI of the block significantly. We averaged around 1800 PSI with our system. But these blocks with that soil were 25, 2560 was the record. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm sure it was, everything else was the same. So I'm sure it was just those little chips of granite in there. So if you can get a little gravel, that's great. Um, it's like when you pour a sidewalk, you wouldn't pour a sidewalk with sand and, and pour it. You know, you want that gravel, it's uh, the strength. So, and then the sand, you want it to be multi-grained and sharp. And the, and the test for that at the laboratory is just a, a granular distribution test. It's just a series of those screens like I showed you out in the garage 
except it's in the lab and they have the whole set that goes from you know one inch down to 200 and they get you they get you a graph that shows you your granular distribution you'd like it to be very you'd also like your sand to be sharp as opposed to round uh, you know river sand is frequently round and uh, it will work but it's not as good you know I don't want to make it sound like you have to have the perfect matrix to make an earth block particularly if you're stabilizing it you know you've got a pretty wide parameter of clay percentage and types of sand and gravel or not you know okay if the average block is 1800 psi what's the reference point for concrete simply what's concrete typically 3000 I mean, concrete comes in all kinds of PSIs, but 3,000 is sort of your standard mix that you're going to get in a, in, in a truck in San Antonio. You know, five sack, three quarter rock, 3,000 PSI. You know. But, you know, harder isn't necessarily better. That's an American problem that we think harder is better. <laughs> and you don't. Uh, you know, earth blocks are softer, and lime plaster is softer, and the women are softer. So there's three votes for it's better to be soft. <laughs> Other questions? James, your, your yeah. two-chamber mixing device with the auger and the belt, is that something you made, or who, who manufactures that product? Yeah, yeah. Mine is a one-off. Um, uh, there are manufacturers, more manufacturers now than when I... Decided. I, I built with unstabilized blocks for three years and in Colorado and got sick and tired of uh, passion water damage and got, and you know, trying to be Mr. Green, you know, I'm just using soil, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I look in the dumpster at the end of the job and there's, you know, $1,000 worth of six mil black poly in the dumpster where I've been covering my walls during construction because I didn't know when it was going to rain. You know, well, that's not, that's not so good either. Maybe a little bit of cement would be okay. And uh, then I started stabilizing the cement. And at that point, I knew, I knew that just tossing it around in the pile, the guy that taught me just put out a big pile of dirt. And he dumped four bags of cement on it and put it tossing it around with his backhoe and said, yeah, there you go. And I went, hey, no, it doesn't look so good to me. Um, because, because it's it's slow for one thing, it's not thorough for another, and getting your moisture content uh, is important. You know, you don't want it to be too wet, you don't want it to be too dry. So you know, he's out there tossing around with the, the backhoe while I'm spraying it with a hose, and I'm going, you know, I'll bet we could do better. And so I had a guy in Batesville, Colorado, build a mixer for me based on what I told him I wanted it to do, and he did it, and uh, it worked. And then the next year, I took it to Bill Powell in San Ysidro, New Mexico, and he made it better. Uh, he fixed I ran it for a year, and I found out it was, you know, what needed to go faster and slower and harder and blah, blah, blah. And Bill fixed it. And I'm still using it. It's uh, 17 years old, and uh, it works. But now there's, there are uh, machine manufacturers that are making mixers. You know, ACT in San Antonio makes a mixer. Uh, Bill Powell, uh, Powell and Sons, actually they changed their name, they're Earth Tech now. In San Isidro, they make a mixer. Um, you can go on, uh, Hydroform in Africa makes a good mixer. Um, Marchin is working on making the affordable good mixer right now. Good. Right? <laughs> Today. <laughs> yeah. Today. All right. <laughs> well, it would be a boon to the industry because it, mine's a, you know, it's a, it's a dual axle monster, you know. It's a, a five thousand pound machine that costs forty thousand dollars. You know, it's this isn't something that's going to make earth blocks common. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we need we need a, a cheaper mixer. And you know, mine's real fast, but it doesn't have to be that fast. Uh, you know, you you don't you can make blocks faster than guys can lay them. So you know, what's the point of making them any faster than that? You know what I mean? I mean one way of looking at it. Uh, no, but the last statement, I mean, won't. you're never pressing live block. I mean, if you're stabilizing, so that's not not a good comparison. Yeah. Oh, right. Math, yeah. right, right. You're not going to you're not going to take them out of the machine and put them in the wall. <laughs> you're making a new bag. Okay. okay. Uh, can you tell us about the how do you treat the water? Is there a sprayer in that machine of yours? <laughs> yeah, we have a 
So there's a bar that goes uh, above the final auger, the one that mixes the, the sand, soil, stabilizer, and water. There's this auger going out and dumping it out <coughs> again. And it has a bar over the top with little spritzers in it. And we're putting the water in. We mix it dry for a couple of feet, and then we get the water right at the end. Then it falls out the end, goes into a pile. We pick it up with the skids there and put it in a block machine. Mm -hmm. What's that in the moisture content? What's the quantity of the moisture content? Well, 10% roughly, or, you know, maso menos. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, what, once you make a few blocks, you know. I mean, you just, you, this stuff's falling out of the mixer and you put it in your hand. And you should be able to put it into a ball with your hand, in other words, when you take your fingers out, you should have a clump of your material there. But it shouldn't be, it should be loosely bound together. You should be able to take your finger and poke that and it should fall apart. Okay? So, because if it doesn't, you're too wet. You know? And, and if it's, if you can't make a ball with it, if you can't, if it, it won't hold its form when you squeeze it, it's too dry. So that's, that's not the percentage, but that's that's what happens. Now, the other thing about it is the machine will tell you if your mix is too wet or too dry. If the, if the mix is too dry and your blocks come out, they're going to have these crumbly corners that you can just flake off. You know, you don't have enough moisture. If, they, if the machine starts kind of extruding them and they got cracks in them right away, it's too wet. You know, so it's um, that's not a scientific percentage answer, but that's seat of the pants in the field thing, you know. You, it, it, it's not rocket science. You know, I can say that, squeezing it like that and then poking it, you'll know in minutes. <laughs> okay? J James, once you start pressing blocks, is there, uh, do you stop throughout the day to test them to make sure your composition is still accurate, or uh, what's your procedure there? No, no. Um, you know, our soil's been selected and screened, and it's all in a, in a huge pile. We know what it is. And we have a stabilizer, whether it's lime or cement or a combination, we know exactly what that is. And we have something that adds some moisture, and that's just water. And so, not really. Um, we just keep going. We do test. You know, the New Mexico Code is ridiculously forgiving. You're supposed to test one block at every 5,000. But that's not really enough. Um, but we test we test our blocks. Uh, you know, we test some. Well, we've we've tested some before we go into production. You know, we've made a dozen and let them cure and got them crushed for PSI. And we go, okay, we're at 1,500. Let's go. And then the, the ingredients are consistent from that point uh, in, in the way I do it. Uh, if you're out there just digging around in a field making your own little of this, little of that, then I guess I test a little <laughs> more often. But you really need to get your, your materials, <coughs> the, homo, the homogeneity of your ingredients established before you go into full production. You see how, what I'm saying? How about for tropical climates? Can you talk to anything about that, hot and humid? Tropical Tropical climates, I heard, and... Yeah, just to speak on that a little bit, if uh, any considerations for the heat and humidity in terms of the construction and how you waterproof it or things like that. You wouldn't use lime, for instance, always Portland, or how does that go? Um, well, the, the kind of stabilizer I would use would still depend on the clay. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd use lime if the clay would accept it <clears throat> and the client wanted it. Um, but, uh, for instance, I've done a lot of work in Haiti, and we use cement all the time because we can't, we can't get lime. They don't have any. Mm -hmm. I went down on the earthquake, and they've never uh, rebuilt it, I guess. Um, so we're using Portland cement there. Uh, the heat and the humidity, yeah, it's, um, it's hard on the workers. It, it's not going to stop you from making a block. You know, the, uh, the, I guess the most negative thing about heat would be just, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to cure them, you know, at less than 110. Um, but if that's all you've got, it'll still work. 
I mean, we did it in Haiti. We, we put the pile to cure under the, the closest batch of trees we could find, you know, and we covered it. So the humidity, um, you know, just slow the curing, probably a good thing. You know. Okay. Um, what about using this product for a commercial project and dealing with building codes and um, structural engineers? <laughs> Somebody always had this answer. Well, yeah, it's a, it's certainly a viable building product. We have used it for commercial buildings, uh, not very many, but the one we're building right now is a commercial building. It's inside the city limits of San Antonio, Texas, so a major city with building departments and all that kind of stuff. And I've never been stopped. Um, you know, do that, but uh, I've been questioned, uh, but I just, I take in the blocks, I take in the, the test results from uh, the laboratory. Um, here's my girlfriend, my wife's away from town. This is Chips. Hi, Chips. Say hi to everybody. Meow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, anyway, I take in the test results, and I say, here, look, and I haven't any problem getting the blocks accepted, and then you need an engineer, and, and you, know, you don't always need an engineer, but sometimes you need an engineer, and if you have a, an earth-friendly engineer, you, you have a friend of ours, and I'm grateful for them, because when they do their engineering on the building and say, we need to do this or that for reinforcement, or you need to put a you know, this or that, here or there, and you take that into the building department with an engineer stamp on it, and they're always okay with it. You know, they've basically been released from their liability because the engineer put his stamp on it, okay? Um, there's, I've built in a lot of places where it's much easier than that, out in the country in Texas and out in the country in Colorado and out in the country in Mexico, and, you know, there, there aren't any inspectors well, Which is, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying it's easier. To CSI do. of 1,800 is pretty low. In Haiti, and we've had a heck of a time in Haiti because, as you well know, it's a, an incredible seismic zone. Uh, we need to be real careful. Um, we can't get engineers in the United States to sign off on something in Haiti because it's not their. They don't have a license there, or they don't want to touch it because it's Haiti or. Uh, they're scared of it because it's a seismic zone or whatever. And my sponsor in Haiti and myself have uh, decided that we would proceed, nonetheless, uh, just doing the very best that we know and, and not letting uh, the lack of the codes or inspectors in Haiti deter us from building better houses for people. I mean, what they're in right now is going to fall down for sure. <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, fifty thousand in Port au uh, with concrete. So uh, we can't do worse than that, and um, and we're going to do better. I mean, we do do better because we are very uh, attuned to reinforcement systems and what works and what works the best. Um, what I think works the best is based on the research done in Lima at the Universidad Católica. Uh, they are, have a full-size shake table there. Peru shakes all the time. Lots of the campesinos die in their adobe houses because they're poorly built, don't have any reinforcement, don't have any bond beams, don't have any nothing, and they fall over. So uh, Marcel Blondet and Gladys at the uh, Universidad Católica have been intent on testing uh, earthen blocks and adobe buildings on their shake table for decades. And the best uh, reinforcement system that they've come up with is the basket, which is a uh, mesh on both sides, and it's through tied to it itself. So that when the building moves on the shake table, it'll do this, but it doesn't fall over. And um, there's a, actually, you can see that. I think if you go to my website, there's a video of me blabbing at the uh, treehouse in Austin. And in that, I think in that in that PowerPoint, I'm pretty sure, is, I think I are these two shake tables from Lima. 
and you can you can actually see what the basket does it's it's amazing it's amazing so that's what we're promoting now in haiti we did three school buildings with rebar with blocks uh, that had uh, holy blocks and u blocks so that we can have a cage of vertical and horizontal rebar inside the earthen wall um, is what we did the first three buildings with but now we're we're using the baskets uh, but that, I, I digress again from your question. What about engineers and building funds? You know, you you have to go in with them for sure. And but you go in, you know, uh, not challenging, but you know, you know how it is. They they have the hammer and a lot of genuflecting and bootlicking and explaining yourself. <laughs> but giving them giving them test results is is effective. And then if you've got an engineer stamp, you're golden. You know and. Uh, we're hoping to, uh, you know, there's, there are, our country's pretty much dead last in this, is, is, a, is the problem. I mean, there's plenty of earth block buildings in, in Bogota and Mexico and, you know, all over the world. Australia, New Zealand, uh, <coughs> lots of, lots of them, but uh, we, um, we're doing the David and Goliath thing here. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, sorry, just to follow up on that, with the test results, one time is enough for the engineer's stamp, or do you have to say, oh, I'm going to provide you results like in the middle of the process, make sure my bricks are still good? Yeah, that's, we do that. Um, I haven't, I haven't really been asked to do that. I've given them test results of the blocks, which doesn't make any sense. I mean, your question is a good one, and it should be going through your pile and you get a week into it, you pull some out of the middle and you go go get them crushed, make sure your PSI is still good, you know. And we do that on, on our jobs, but not because we're forced to. Uh, it just makes sense, you know. Makes me feel comfortable, makes the customer feel comfortable, and it's not that expensive, you know. So, But uh, I, I would imagine that when earth block codes become common in the United States, which they're not, uh, that it's going to be like any other building code, although, you know, the IBC now and all that kind of stuff just makes it a little different. But, you know, local building departments can overrule the state and they can overrule the IBC if they want to make it more stringent. Uh, they can't make it less so, but they can make it more so. So <coughs> you're going to be dealing with individual building departments and their, their particular requirements. Do you, do you and if they were smart, they'd ask you to, you know, do one block in a thousand or something as you went through the pile or something like that. That'd be good. Do you use Maybe we'll put that in the code. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you use uh, the blocks that you build uh, yeah, that you build for roofs? Do you do you ever have a problem like if you build, if you use them for roofs like domes or arcs uh, and and do you have any problem with the time but I don't know, after rain for five years and so on, do they degrade in their ability to hold the water? And if you plaster them, like with any rainproof or anything that basically would protect them from the water, how does that still keep the breathability in general working? Okay, yes, I have done some barrel vault roofs with earth blocks. My partner Jeff in Mexico has done multiple domes with uh, uh, cunhas, brick-sized earth blocks. Uh, we've done a lot of roofs uh, between us. And um, on the house I recently did in Fredericksburg, they had three barrel barrel vaults for the roof. Um, I did 6% stabilization for the walls, but I, I did 10% for the roof blocks. Okay. I also made smaller blocks. They were they were 6 by 12 by, by 2 and a half. So that they looked, you know, it was more for look. Um, and then, um, and then I waterproof them. You know, I mean, they're they're stable. I I believe they're always going to be okay forever. But it's a roof, and I used to be a roofer <laughs> before I was a carpenter, before I was an earth block guy. And I'm all about uh, chips. <laughs> 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 The, uh, yeah, I waterproof the top. I mean, it's just, you know, you know EPDM or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, roofing material. Uh, and, it, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not 
even pretending to try to breathe through the roof. Okay? I just don't. Um, it's waterproof. Um, What's and, the biggest? Uh, I'll count on the walls for doing my, uh, my in and out, you know? Okay? What's the biggest width of a vault? And I know, I, know, I, know Jeff, I know Jeff does the same in Mexico with his, uh, his, his domes. He's got uh, some maestros down there that are building beautiful domes out of uh, Cunha-sized blocks from an oil press. But they, you know, they waterproof the top completely. What's the max vault dimension? Width. Span width? Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that there is one. Um, there's a guy, boy, I don't know if he's still alive or not. Now, what was funny about that? I'm glad we <laughs> What's the largest, uh, yeah. Let's see what we're going to Anyway, anyway, he's got, he's got pictures of, uh, this, you know, fired brick dome that he built basically over the parking lot of a shopping center. Um, <laughs> you know, as long as it's an arch, I don't know that there's a, a limit. Um, you know, there's some, there's some rules, of course, mathematical rules that are going to make it better if the camera's higher or lower, depending on the span and stuff like that. But, you know, Sapomaini and in some of his buildings in Oroville are multi-story, five-story buildings. And the floors in between the five stories are uh, brick vaults. Whoa. Very, very low cambered brick vaults. And then he just flattens them out on the top of the floor. Wow. Whoop. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he's a... He's a good builder. If you haven't been to the Oroville site, that's a good place to go. What's the name? What the name of that site? Oroville. Erd. Uh, what's the yeah, person's -A -R name? Sapram Maini. He's actually uh, French. He's a graduate of Crotter. He changed his name to Sapram when he moved to India in 1989 and took over the Oroville Institute. Um, I consider him maybe to be the genius of, of our field. Um, yeah, the things he's done are unbelievable. The, the website, E-A-R-T-H-Oroville, A-U-R-O-V-I-L-L-E.com. Um, yeah, that was, I was just at his wedding in France a few months ago. Here's uh, Saffron and Laura, right there. There they are. And Laura, his bride, is an engineer from MIT who uh, assisted John Oxendorf when they wrote the book on Glossogino vaulting. So these two, these two getting together, pretty incredible. Uh, if you want to see vaults and domes, that's the place to go. Okay. Jim, have you ever used these for driveways? To, in other words, trying to make oh, a yeah. road or uh, no? No, no, I haven't. I had a neighbor that was intent on making his back patio out of it, and I begged him not to do it, uh, but he did, and then he tore it out a year later. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, it might, it might be possible. I, had, you know, I mean, I would, I would try it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't try it and charge a customer for it until I had done it myself successfully, but. You know, if you put a, if, if you put 12% Portland cement in them and, you know, had cement mortar between them uh, and put a good sealer over them, uh, it's probably okay. But, no, I haven't done it. What about uh, uh, I've foundations? Them, I've used them as, as earthen floor uh, in, inside. Um, if you're familiar with the way earthen floors are typically made, you know, they're packing uh, several layers of, of soil to get up to that finished coat that goes on top. 
and I'm going, gee, there, there's you know, a lot of dirt packed in there, and I've got packed dirt. So we put the we put the earth blocks down as the sub base for the finished floor uh, on an earth floor. Let me, let me grab a couple. I'll be right back. Let me grab a couple of things. So that big one, he said, yeah, that was fire. But yeah, Oroville Institute in India, yeah, they've got some structures that you're like, how does that stand? Their website is amazing. Yeah. But is there, is there different pauses to make the fire block? Possible to what? A Sorry. different pauses to make the fire block versus the... Yeah, fire would be just totally different technology where you take the clay and burn it. No, chips, you can't take my chips. No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> different. <laughs> Probably, I guess, different clay content, I guess. James, I was also curious about, what about using it for foundations or stem walls? Foundations and stem walls, uh, they do it in Mexico uh, a lot. I, uh, I don't. Um, so I guess the answer is yes, it can be done. Uh, my answer is uh, I prefer the gravel trench, the rubble trench, and, and Martin and I have talked quite a bit about that, so he can give you my my thoughts on that, but as a way to save uh, concrete and steel, uh, high embodied energy products, um, gravel, gravel is my answer, and with a, a concrete grade beam over the top. But uh, I've seen a lot of adobe houses in, in Mexico where they use the adobes for the foundation. They're still there. You know. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. Jim, you mentioned that you, for the in for, for interior flooring, that you do use blocks as a sub-base, and then you finish it with something. What do you finish it with? Uh, clay, uh, clay and sand. The, I was going to get you the book, but I loaned it. <laughs> um, there's an earthen floor book by Supita Ray Kimmel. Kimmel or Krimmel. S-U-K-I-T-A. R E A Y, I think, and then Kimmel, K I M M E L. And uh, her co author is a fellow named something Thompson. And it's just called Earth and Floors, I believe. And it's, it's, it's a really great book, and it's got the answers for it. You know, anything you want to know about Earth and Floors, I would, I would go there. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a clay sand uh, thing, and then you, you finish it so that, you know, with. The, the standard finish is uh, uh, linseed oil and paint thinner, uh, but you know we're kind of searching around for something better. Beeswax has been used, but I've never used it, but I'd like to. Um, but anyway, I, I would check check their book and uh, get get those answers. But it's a it's a it's a two coat process. When you get to that hard layer, and now you're going to put the finish on it. It's a it's a two coat process of and clay and sand, basically. So yeah. for, for the bricks that you use, do you always use flat bricks, or do you use any other uh, shapes and so on of the bricks? You know, for any seismic, you just mentioned the hollow ones. For the Oroville website, you can see different shapes that they press and so on. Uh, I don't know what what's your most used, frequently used shapes are. OK. My, my, you know, again, the uh, Saffron's website, you'll see if, if, if you buy every mold that he makes, you can make like 75 different blocks. It's uh, pretty amazing. But um, my machines here in Texas are all uh, rectangles, flat rectangles, you know, uh, 6 by 12s, 7 by 14s, and 10 by 14s are the three sizes we make here in Texas. And that's all I've used in Texas and in Colorado. Um, I'm... I'm not in a seismic zone. In, in Haiti and in Mexico, I'm using an, an Ital Mexicana machine from Mexico City that makes the U blocks and the holy blocks so that we could put the, the reinforcement in. I really like the U blocks and the holy blocks. I like that feature, uh, not just for the seismic, but just for running you know, electrical conduit or stuff like that. You know, it's pretty handy. And then we did an experiment in Haiti with uh, uh, two, 
two cores wide. It's, 30, it's only 30 centimeters, but the, the blocks are 15 by 30 and lay two parallel courses and had a horseman on the inside course. And then the outside course, we left the, the cores open. And then we punched a hole at the bottom and punched a hole at the top, the idea being that the hot air would go up and out. I don't have any test results on that, so I, I don't know if it worked or not, but uh, I think it would. But um, so, yeah, I've used um, U-blocks and holy blocks in Haiti and in Mexico, but only rectangles here. Uh, Morris Jetter, the manufacturer in San Antonio, is do you know why people have been using blocks that are rectangles, flat rectangles, for eight millennia? Why is that, Lawrence? Because they work. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do. And they, some of the real fancy blocks now, the curly cues and, you know, tongues and grooves and all kinds of that kind of stuff. You know, I get the point. Um, their, their point being, it's easy to keep them straight. And they interlock together. Da, da, da. My concern about them is that some of them don't leave enough room in between the tongue and the groove to get any mortar in there. And I'm a, I was a friend and a fan of uh, Fred Webster, a seismic engineer in California, who unfortunately died last year. Uh, Fred engineered building buildings in California for 40 years. He's from Stanford and real shot. So there's a lot of seismic reinforcement there, but he, when I would talk about, you know, if you, if you mentioned the word dry stack to him, you could sort of see him start to shake, you know, and veins start to pop out of his neck. And, and uh, he just, he just, he was an engineer, and the idea of not mortaring your blocks together was, <laughs> he was, he was not in favor of that. So um, even if they're interlocking, it seems like there ought to still be some mortar in there. Another problem with the interlocking blocks is, um, you know, they're great for going in a straight line, but the, the beauty of the rectangle is, of course, you can go in curves and circles and arches, and you can do anything with a block that doesn't have curly cues and tongues and grooves on it. So it's more, there's more things you can do with it, okay? What do you use That's for mortar? Question. What, what when do you, do you use what? For mortar. What do we use for mortar? Um, a similar mix to the blocks, only a little richer in stabilizer and richer in sand. Okay, I, I you know, it's it's more like it's it's not getting the benefit of that compression that you get in the machine of mashing those clay particles around the sand. You know, you know, you're not getting that when you're just sticking it in the mortar. So I want the mortar to be more stabilized. Um, so higher stabilizer and higher sand, less clay. Um, how much Basically. Can we add but still the same the same yeah. ingredients. I'm using the same the same materials, just a little different ratio. Can you just quantify that a little in more detail? Those ratios? Um, okay, well if my blocks were six percent Portland, my stabilizer would be ten percent Portland. And I would add uh, I would just up the sand. You know, I would I would Increase the sand by, you know, 50% of what it was in the original mix. You know, and what I do for the mortar is, is, you know, I, I can't give you a standard formula because it really depends on the block. You know, what you made the block out of it. So I do mortar tests beforehand, and what I do when I do a mortar test is, uh, well, I stick three blocks together. Okay, with my test mortars, these different ratios. And I think this will work, this will work, let's try a little more of this, a little more of that. And I make these little sandwiches of three blocks, and I let them cure for a long time, you know, a couple weeks, make sure that the mortar is completely cured. Then I take that three block stack, and I tip it up on its edge, and I support the outside two blocks with something underneath them, so the center block is simply suspended in the air, okay? And then I start loading that with weight. <laughs> and the one that wins is the one I use. The one that takes the most weight before that block finally uh, comes loose from the, from the mortar. 
And what's There's some, some very expensive uh, tests you can do at the laboratory where you build a meter by a meter wall and you tip it up on its edge and they, they crush it from the corners, but it's, it's too expensive uh, for me. <laughs> so. And the moisture just, content uh, in the mortar itself? Uh, cheap milkshake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, or maybe, or maybe a little more expensive milkshake. <laughs> but you, you want to be able to pour it. You want to be able to pour it. You don't have to take your trowel and dig it out. You know, and do this. It's not like buttering fire bricks. It's, you want to be able to pour it on, stick them in there. We we do a thing called the airplane where we put it on the on the course, and then we slide it up to the block next to it so that the mortar squirts up in between the, the head joint like that faster just faster to lay that way you know then did you see the guys when i bought my first machine in 95 the guy that sold me the machine said now jim you're going to get guys that want to come work for you and they're going to show up at your door and say i'm a mason and they got one of those big pointy trowels he said you don't want them because they're going to they're going to want to just they're going to want to stand there and butter the block you know, butter the head joint, butter the, you know, blah, 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 you know, tap, 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 play around with it. it. Takes too long, and that's what Martian is. I know is focusing on is how to do this faster, and um, that's good because you know we are in competition uh, with other building systems, and labor is our biggest cost in, in the United States. So quicker is better, and um, you know we've been we've been working on ways to. What's the fastest way to get these in the wall, but to keep them level and plumb and straight, you know, story well, pulls. Can you go into more, de can you go into more detail yeah. about that, James, about what, what your favorite and fastest technique is to actually assemble a building? Okay, well, we, we always use story pulls, um, being, you know, vertical uprights at the corners from which you can pull the strings to keep your build, your courses straight, okay? we. I've been doing it long enough that I've had some story poles made. We use angle iron. Um, three by three by three sixteenths is my favorite size. Um, and the three by three is because the, the line blocks hook on it real nicely. And the three sixteenths is because if you do an eighth, you can bend it. And if you do the quarter, they're too heavy to move around. So three by three by three sixteenths, 10 foot pieces. We stand them up on the corners of the building put angle braces on them so that they stay perfectly plumb. We have squared them to each other so that when we put our mason's block and our string on that story pole, we know that that wall is going to be, that the course is going to be perfectly level and the wall is going to be perfectly plumb. It takes a little while to put up the story poles, but you'll save 10 times as much time putting it up uh, as you did, if you didn't uh, use the story poles. And you think your building's perfectly, your walls are perfectly straight, and perfectly plumb, which is you know, important, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in a seismic zone. As Fred always pointed out, I mean, it's it's easier to tip over a wall that's already crooked. You know, <laughs> your, your first step in seismic reinforcement is make your walls plumb. You know, so. Right. Hey, James. That's what so we do. And then. And then we mix, we mix, you know, we have a mixer, we mix a lot of mortar at once um, because in, in, in the wheelbarrows and the hotties taken off of the block layers. And my favorite system is that I use feed scoops, like you buy at the feed store to spread the feed out for your poultry or whatever. They're perfect because they have a handle and they hold about the right amount for a block, you know? I dip that in, spread it out, smoosh it around a little bit, set the block in it, slide it up to the block next to it so that the mud squirts up in the head joint. And then my guys, I always, they're armed with a rubber mallet and a little torpedo level. And we set the torpedo level on the block and tap it with a rubber mallet so it's perfectly, not perfectly level, but just between the lines. I cut that. Next block in the mud, squirt it up, tap, 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 move on down. That's that's the system we use. And, uh, maybe there's a better one, and I'm I'm anxious for uh, Martian. I'm anxious for you to find it. <laughs> All right, hey.
Excellent. And if we can do to go faster, you know. James, uh, checking in on time. Are, do we still have time for? We're going to discuss a little bit about the overall construction technique from foundation to to finish for a block building, or. Okay. Uh, what, what time is it? Right we got twelve forty three. Okay, uh, yeah, I talk a lot when I get going like this. Um, well, the overall construction system, uh, you're talking about the foundation, walls, bond yeah. beam, roof attachment, that sort of thing? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mentioned that I like, I like the rubble trench. You know, I, I, I prefer to dig a trench and pack it full of uh, ballast rock than I would to fill it full of uh, rebar and concrete. I think that the foundation system is actually better. Uh, it's certainly environmentally less damaging. There's a lot less body energy in gravel than there is in, in Portland cement and rebar. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright liked it, so that's a testimonial for it. He brought it to this country. And the, I, the theory is that, you know, if, if it can move a little bit, that's a good thing. If you lock your, your building into the ground with, with walls of concrete, and the ground moves or the clay shrinks and swells or whatever, uh, you, could, you could have cracking in the foundation. Uh, if you have gravel, obviously you can't crack it. It's already you know, a series of billion cracks. And so if you can push on it and let go of it, and push on it and let go and nothing happens, it's better. Um, and then I put a steel reinforced grade beam over the top of that. Uh, so I'm still using steel and I'm still using concrete and the engineers like it. But I'm using a lot less. And it's perfectly level and perfectly square or perfectly whatever the building is. And then we put up the story poles, which I just told you about on the corners. Use mason blocks with a string. They slide up and down the story poles. You're not tying any knots. Uh, they just slide up and down. I mark the story poles every four inches uh, after they're in place with a built floors level to get a level mark. And then mark out all the way to the bond beam. All the guys have to do is slide the string to the line, and everything's going to be perfect. Um, the story pole is mounted to the outside of the building because we build from the inside. Um, you really get, you know, for a lot of good reasons. One, typically inside is flat. And so you can roll scaffolding around or move about easily on a flat floor. If you put your scaffolding on the outside of the building and you happen to build in some place like Colorado, uh, outside the building might be 150 feet down, you know, if you don't know. It's hard to set up the scaffolding sometimes when the ground's like this. So inside the building, it's flat. Also, the story poles are on the outside. That way you're setting the block to the string you're not lifting the block over the string. Okay, so you're less, less work for the masons. Um, that story pole is on the outside of the building. As I mentioned, it's 316 thick. So what that means is that your string is actually going to be 360, 316ths of an inch outside of the building line. Oh, no. This is a very good thing because... What your masons need to do is you tell them, set, set the block as close as you can to the string and don't touch it. You know, because as soon as you touch it, the wall's crooked. So if we're 3 sixteenths away and it's an adobe building, we're going to be fine. You know, we don't have a little 3 sixteenths caliber we hold between the string and the block. We just set it up there and everybody learns what 3 sixteenths is pretty quick. <laughs> and that's where it sits. So... Up we go. Then when we put the bond beam on, typically we use concrete bond beams. Very rarely a wooden bond beam, although it is legal and is a lot faster and cheaper to use a wooden bond beam, that's for sure. Um, but the concrete bond beams, we use 12-inch uh, strips of plywood that we fasten to the side of the building down one course. The bond beam is 8 inches thick. We put however much steel in it the engineer specifies, and, um, and we pour it. But the other thing I do to try to tie the bond beam to the building, or not to try, but to tie, is on the top course of blocks, I don't put the blocks together. I leave uh, two and a half inches, masa menos, more or less, 
in between the blocks on the top course that gap that you see on the outside where the concrete would run out is covered by the 12 inch form board on your 8 inch bond beam so it's not running out and what happens is you get these little teeth of concrete that go down in between the blocks on the top course in those gaps I put number three rebar vertically which serves as the chairs to tie my horizontal rebar to but also gives me steel down into that top course there's this is nothing I don't know that you'll find this written anywhere it's just a, a, a system I developed to, partially because of Fred who said you need to attach the bond beam to the top of the building Code says you can let it sit there because it's heavy and it's continuous and it's not going anywhere but Fred had seen enough walls falling that had fallen out from underneath bond beams when he would go to uh, the aftermath of seismic events in South America or Los Angeles or whatever. So he urged me to tie the bond beam to the top course. Um, subsequently, Charles Graham, uh, formerly another one of my dear friends who died last year, uh, was the dean at the University of Oklahoma and a very good friend of Earthblocks. He used to be the dean at Texas A&M. He bought a machine there. Uh, then he went to Oklahoma. He had a machine there. And they they tested the theory in the, in the engineering lab that they have. It's called the Pierce Lab. And they put the, the concrete feet on it and found it to be exponentially stronger than without. So I got actual scientific reinforcement for the, the theory. How deep does that rebar go into the top top beam there? into the block? Well, it's, it's obviously it's going past the first block because it's in a gap, all right? And so I just drill a little bit into the block below that, just enough to, so that they'll stand up. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So it's actually, if, if it's a four inch course, that, that piece of number three rebar is four inches plus an inch, five, and then plus another six, so if you're tying a cage on the top of it, you know, so I'm cutting 12 inch pieces and they're in a block one inch, another four inches, and then they're up in the, in the bond being six or seven inches. How, you are follow? You, how are you reinforcing head conditions at windows and doors? Windows and doors? Um, well, lintels uh, over the top either wood or concrete. Wood's a lot prettier and sure a lot faster um, to put over the door and window. The code says you need to go past the opening one foot. I always go 18 inches because then you're always at least covering two blocks. You're not sitting on one block with the lintel. You follow me? The, the door buck is made out of two by four or two by six. It's just a frame box to which you're gonna attach the door and window just like you would in a frame building, it stays. But you don't set the lintel on top of the buck. The buck is simply a frame to hold the door and window. It's not meant to be vertical support. Right. I made this mistake on the first house I built. I was a carpenter, so I made my, my bucks and my blocks come out absolutely level on the first story. I put the lintel on there while well, I was proud of myself. You know, it just perfect flat across there. Then I went up, I put a bond beam, I put a second story on it out of earth blocks, another bond beam, roof, came back, put the windows in, and the legs of the <laughs> box were, uh, can you see me? Yeah. 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 They're like this, okay? So uh, the weight just took them down. So you leave, you leave a little space, you know, quarter inch, three eighths, something, uh, between the top of the door and window buck and the bottom of the lintel. So that when the thing settles during construction, you don't crush, crush the buck. Okay. Um, we and, and fastening, uh, you know, typical American windows with the fins, like your nail on a stick building. We do the same thing. We're nailing those on the buck. But there's a detail issue at the top. Let's say you've got this wooden lintel, right? And now you've got this buck underneath it and you've got this fin nailed to the buck, and there's the fin. You can see the fin underneath the lintel. And so you have to put another little piece of wood trim across there or a little strip of plaster. It looks funny. 
it's more work and blah 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 so what we do now is we we figure out exactly where that pin needs to be in the lintel and we do a saw curve in the lintel set it up there and then that top pin slides up into the lintel so you know it can't possibly leak you know we squirt a little caulking up there in the in the saw curve slide the pin up in the lintel and then nail the sides and you, it's clean you know you don't have another piece of trim you can't possibly leak blah blah, blah. perfect um so are you flat are, when you are you flashing those windows onto the block so in other words y yes yes that's a that's a real sensitive spot right there it's a good question you've got that buck there you've got the spin on it the buck's up against an earth block okay you're going to bring your plaster around and it's going to cover that fin but you've got metal wood earth block and plaster all coming together there four different ingredients in one spot they expand and contract at different rates with temperature and moisture and what have you so it's a it's a touchy spot so i use uh, bituthane you know it's basically rubber with stick them on the back and i use it for the window flashing and it sticks right on that fin no problem and it sticks right on the wooden buck no problem it doesn't stick very well to the to the earth blocks because not many things stick to dirt you know but i still bring it around and out typically i've rounded that corner because uh, we're going to roll the, most of the buildings I don't know what, this is back to that male-female thing, you know, I, I look at these German Lutheran cathedrals here in Texas, and boy, they're beautiful, they're just perfect, you know, crisp and sharp, and sharp corners, you know, everything, you know, and the windows are all perfectly spaced apart, it's like, it just drives me crazy, you know, these are German engineers and masons, you know, and then I look at our adobe houses with the soft rounded corners and the flowing this and that, and I go, you know, those are male buildings and ours are female buildings. Mm. And the females are better. They always have to talk. You know? So we've got these rounded returns into the window. And uh, so I take that bitch of thing and I bring it on around. And I, I, I hold it up there with uh, roofing nails or screws or depending on oh, how your blocks are. So I fasten it up there. And then we mesh over that and we pack that on top and blah, blah, blah. But that, that gap in between the metal and the wood and the earth block and the plaster, I'm using, again, it's like my same, my same question, same answer. Can't leak, no way. <laughs> you know, I just get after it, make sure it doesn't happen. On your okay. rubble, on the rubble foundation, Pardon? on the rubble foundation, uh, are you compacting to a certain level or are you compacting at all? Oh yeah, we're compacting. Bang, yeah. bang, bang. Actually, a plate compactor. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and the rock that we use is called ballast rock. It's uh, two and a half inch or three inch minus. Uh, it's sharp, and it's it's what you see uh, under the railroad tracks. Which, as I was telling Martin the other day, is you know yeah. a testimonial to why it's a good foundation. I mean, you know, they, they don't pour concrete under railroad tracks mm. because it would crack. You know, the trains, those locomotives would go over it and that would be garbage in no time. No, no, they, they pack ballast rock underneath the railroad tracks and those trains go over, nothing happens. So are you, are you compacting to a certain density or do you just do it visually? Uh, we just do it visually. I mean, we just, we run over it uh, big. Basically, until it doesn't go down anymore. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, how, how deep is we, it typically? This one we just did, the, the gravel was two feet deep. We put it in in, in eight inch lifts, and then we just walked around with the, the plate compactor until we weren't getting any. It was just rolling over the top and wasn't doing anything. What's, now, what's what your, percent compaction that was, I don't know. What's your plate, compactor, was plate tight. compactor size? What, Pardon? What size are you using on a uh, plate compactor? Yeah, plate compactor. No, what size is it? How big? How big? Oh, well, they come in different. They come in different sizes. 
We there's a let's see there's a 22 inch and a 28 inch I think and a 14 inch and the trench we had on this last build was uh, was too I don't know but we rented the big one first and it was too hard to move or in the trench you couldn't turn the corners so you're not so using we took it back we took it back and we got the 14 inch wide one. So that we can go around the corners, you know what I mean? So you're not using it, you're not looking good. for a particular they're, they're pounds true. per square, in other words, the play, capac play compactor sizes also relate to pounds per square foot they can lay down. You're not looking for that, anything in particular, you're just size of what fits for your job. Right, I'm just trying to make it work in the trench, and it, it's, the, it's not so much... It's not like a whacker, you know, a thumper. I mean, you're not trying to pound this stuff down. What you're trying to do is vibrate it so it all goes together, you know, as best it can. And uh, and the plate compactor is, is definitely the right tool in the trench. Uh, do you connect the, the, uh, the grade plates to the gravel with rebar or anything? Mm. The grade beam, you mean? Yeah, sorry, the grade beam. The, the steel reinforced grade beam, the concrete grade beam is going to sit on top of the gravel. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, Do you, does any rebar go into the gravel, or does it just sit right on top of the gravel? No. No, no, you, you don't want it to go in the gravel, because if the, if the rebar is exposed below the concrete into the gravel, then it can get moist. And if it gets moist, it'll rust, and the rust will run on up into the concrete. That's why you always have two inches of concrete around your rebar, so that it can't can't rust out on you. You know, I, so no, I don't. But I do have the, the grade beam does go uh, sub grade. Okay, the gravel I bring the gravel up to a few inches below grade, and then my grade beam has a little footing on it, little ears that go out to cover, you know, for anti tippage. Are you okay. using a vapor you barrier it? on top of the gravel? <clears throat> yeah. Um, here, I'm doing a little. Okay, can you see this? Yeah. Yes. There's the trench and all the little pencil marks of the gravel, and they come up a couple inches. The gravel comes up a couple inches below grade. This is grade. Mm -hmm. And then the concrete, this is my concrete grade beam, and it's as wide as my wall, whether it's 12 inches or 14 inches or 10 inches or whatever your earth block thickness is. You can make it a little wider if you want to have a plaster stop on the outside. You can do the same thing on the inside, but that's just finish details. Depending on the plaster, it depends on the baseboard they're going to put inside. There's all kinds of different things you can do there. But but basically what you're doing is you're coming down with your... and I, Six inches is the minimum you're supposed to stay above grade. I typically go eight, and then a couple inches down into the trench on top of the gravel. But no, no steel going down into the gravel, no. It's all in the steel. The rebar is all chips. <laughs> the the uh, the steel is always encased in, in concrete. And then a vapor yeah. barrier or insulation underneath that that the concrete. Yeah, I put a vapor barrier here between the between the concrete and the earth blocks. But not between the gravel. And, and not down here, no. Now, on this last one, we used some stuff called Fastfoot, which is a plastic uh, forming material. Pretty cool. Um, and we wrapped the whole thing. Everything that was concrete was wrapped in this Fastfoot, and it stays. And concrete absorbs, uh, if given the opportunity, three pounds of water per cubic foot, if you'll, if you'll let it. Well, by using this Fastfoot, as a forming material, uh, the concrete will never take on any water. It's water. It's waterproofed on the outside and the bottom. Okay, 
And then I use a, a paint on water sealer on the top. And then are you Between draining the, the gravel? Are you running drains out of that, that base gravel? Yeah, yeah, French draining, um, you know, to daylight or to a dry well, one or the other. This last one we did, the, the foundation was so deep because we're in San Antonio with the worst soil in America. Um, we have French drains all around the outside of the building uh, to prevent moisture from even getting there. So we didn't, in that case, we didn't put, you know, a lot of, because the trench was four feet deep and we, we were never going to get to daylight and uh, enormous hole, you know, to drain it in. So we have French drains that are not that deep and outside the building to take all the water away. Mm -hmm. But typically, I mean, in, in Haiti, we put them in the trench, the French drain pipe. Okay. Yeah, maybe uh, I think we kind of got to start wrapping up here because we've got more stuff to do here. But maybe um, I'm I don't know. sure you do. I'm sure you do. I'm gonna like, get on the road, and I hope it was helpful. Um, one more question, maybe from Tom. Got, got yeah. one, more, more one last question. One more question for you, and I'm I'm just All curious right. what you do, uh, and this this is related to the earth uh, pressing the blocks, and what how do you control the thickness of the blocks that you press? To get, to get a uniform thickness? Uh, the, the machines that I have from AECT in San Antonio have a stop on them where you can make them all the same thickness. We, we press the pressure first, and then when we get about what we want, and we, we're typically doing three and three quarters, just because we're counting on a quarter inch mortar joint and four inch courses. So we press the three and three quarters. So we'll press the pressure until we're getting the right pressure on the needle and about three and three quarters. Then this machine has a, a switch on it that you can switch and you switch the size. And you it reads from a different electronic eye that stops it at three and three quarter every time. Now, this is a pretty special machine and most machines aren't like that. With the ETOM Mini Econo machine, um, we get as consistent as we can with the thickness just by maintaining the mix we're putting in the machine. You know, the, 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 the sand, soil, stabilizer, moisture, mixture is consistent. And if you, if you, if you maintain a consistency there, then the machine is going to produce blocks that are relatively consistent. Actually, I have one last question. But not perfect. Pounds per square foot per inch of block. I mean, what are you looking for? Is there a ratio? Pounds per square. In other words, how much pressure are you putting on each block? Let's say you go an eight oh, or a six. Oh, when we or, make it? Yeah, is there when a ratio in terms? Yeah, when you're making it. Yeah. Um, well, the gauge we're reading on this machine is is it varies between 1,400 and 1,800. Um, you you have to push. Harder if your dirt's a little dry, and softer if your dirt's a little wet. Um, but you know, I just try to get get something as consistent, you know. But it's about fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred psi. Now I'm not sure that's pounds per square inch. That's that's a hydraulic pressure reading on my machine, quite frankly. And so I don't want to mislead you and say that it equals psi. I'm not sure actually. Yeah. Okay. We can talk more about that. Okay, well, James, thank you so much for imparting your wisdom of many years to us. And right. we'll be in touch. Okay. Good luck. Let's do it again sometime. All okay. right. Okay. March and I will see you in November. I will see. Okay. okay. Excellent. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's lunchtime now. We should take take an hour. We're uh, we're at one p. What what time is it? We're at one p.m. So two p.m. We'll get right out there. We'll assemble the bl the block press all together and run it. And then uh, if people are up, we'll press a few block and see if people are up to start the the salt mixer. We can definitely do that. We have the materials.
it's a, a food, whatever people are interested in. I'm definitely going to want to start that, and we'll see how late people want to stay up. But officially, the program should end probably like, you know, like 8 p.m. or dinner time or 7, 7 dinner time or so for the block block part of the workshop until tomorrow we do the, the power cube, the power the universal power source. So okay, break for lunch and we'll see you in an hour.